you for joining us today for another episode of Making Sense of Money. I'm one of your co-hosts, Andrea Pellegrini. Last episode, we had on Seisha Grabenstetter, my colleague from University of Illinois Extension, to talk about some of the basics of investing. If you missed that episode and want to get started on investing yourself or understand at least the terminology (laughs) that is out there, uh, go check it out. And I'm Jake Hamilton, uh, one of your other co-hosts. As Nikki mentioned last episode, she's going to be off for a few months on maternity leave, and we're happy to announce that she's now a mom to an adorable little daughter. So congrats, Nikki. Uh, And in the meantime, you're stuck with Andrea and I. This week, though, Uh, We're going to be diving in a little bit more into investing and focusing in particular on stocks and the stock market that you hear about all the time. And later in the show, we'll talk about one of the bigger recent news stories, GameStop and what happened with its stock in January of 21, January of 2021. Our guest this week is Chase Raywinkle, the director of Illinois' Division of Banking, where Nikki and I work. Uh, Director Raywinkle is actually our first returning guest, so welcome back to the show. Uh, but for those who may yep. have missed that first episode, could you introduce yourself, Chase? Yes, thank you so much, guys. Um, and I also want to give the congratulations to Nikki uh, whenever she gets a chance to listen to this. So thank you for having me as the returning guest. Probably helps that uh, I employ some people here on the uh, on the channel, but it is it is nice to be back. You guys have been doing great work. I am the director of the Division of Banking, where we regulate a lot of the the banking entities here in the state and uh, excited to be back. Thank you, Chase. So we covered this briefly on our last episode, but I'd like to ask you your perspective on how you would define what stocks are, Chase. Yeah, happy to talk about that. I first want to give a brief disclaimer since we're talking about mostly items um, not related to the division of banking. So the opinions on this are my own. They're not the, the opinions of the division of banking or Governor um, Pritzker or any anybody in, in that regard um, or to IDFPR. So just to have that fun, fun to start off. A stock is essentially a share of a, of a company. So when you are buying a stock, you're simply, it's a type of security that indicates a proportionate ownership of an interest in a corporation which is different than like a loan or any other type of security. Thank you. That sounds, that sounds simple enough, but you know, people, I think people often hear people or in the industry, the terms that people refer to as stocks and bonds, you, they hear that together. So what's a bond and how is that different from a stock? How, and how are they maybe similar in some ways? Yeah. Think of a bond as kind of being more of a loan. So, um, you know, a bond is essentially an IOU between the lender and the borrower. And it has payments in an amortization schedule that is that is building on a specific project or, or item like that. Um, a stock is exactly, you know, it, it, it has similar uh, aspects in that it, it is a security, but uh, a, bond, a stock itself uh, has the ability to have ownership. So it, it has that ownership stake within the company and that gives you certain rights and authorities. So those rights can be given up, given on how you, how much stock you own or what negotiations you have. But that's the main difference between a bond and a stock. Thank you. And I just want to clarify, because we'll probably use this term a lot today, but when you say security, what does that mean? So it's it's a it's a bundled asset. So when you have uh, a a stock, it's a type of item that you can that has value that you can buy and sell. Um, on an open market. And um, you can do the same in a bond. Those items are usually built within how most people interact with securities is not in anything other than their like retirement savings program or or something, maybe even student loan savings program, where they have uh, different type of investment options that can be bought and sold at any given time. And uh, the, the, there are stocks and there are bonds and there are other items as well. And uh, so that's, you know, generally what, what a security is. If it's helpful for our listeners, we are doing a webinar covering these terms, like just basically terms like securities, stocks, bonds. By the time this particular podcast comes out, it should be recorded and on the University of Illinois Student Money Management Center's YouTube page if you want to look it up. Yeah, it has a it has a pledged value to it. Think of it that way. 
anything that has a pledged value can be a security. They're often regulated, but not all the time. And they're often uh, bundled, but not all the time. And they can be bought and sold usually in the open market. Yeah, I think it's important at first to get the terminology out of the way. So we can start with that and then move on to the discussion. But these financial tools have been around for a long time. And Chase, I know that you know a little bit about the history of stocks and bonds. I was hoping maybe you could give us a brief history of stocks, so to speak. Like when did they originate and why did we come up with these financial tool tools? Okay, yeah. So think of so when you when you think of stock, you think of them as ownership of a company. They're a small piece of ownership in a company. So why would a, co- a company offer stock? Um, I'm a company. I want, let's say I have a hundred percent ownership stake in company Chase. I want to also, uh, if I give up any of that ownership, then some of the profits of that company will go to somebody else. Why wouldn't I just own that whole company? Well, Remember, with any financial inst- instrument, the reason why it's created is almost certainly because the value of that entity cannot be fully maximized at that point in time. So I am trying to grow my company. There might be an amazing amount of potential in this company. Everybody wants Chase, Chase company related products or what, or our item or whatever, our app or whatever we're doing. Um, but I physically don't have enough money to grow that company to meet those needs. Well, I'm going to sell pieces of ownership of that company in order to get the capital needed to to grow to that size. It could be a capital project or just generally um, something that you're trying to do to grow that entity. This problem existed all the way back uh, when we first had companies, when we we're moving out of kind of, you know, lords and, 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 and ladies having ownership over land and things like that. We, we, we moved when, when companies start trying to grow and become more than just the village that they are adhering to, we run into this problem. So there's a lot of discussion on where stock started from. You can trace it back to some of the Hopen companies in seventh century China. Um, there's a debate about that. There's also limited partnership companies all through 13th century Europe. Probably the most famous stock company that created into what we have as a modern market comes from the Dutch East India Company, which in 1602 issued tradable shares that could be traded on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. So now we have two aspects that are new and people might recognize in their in their discussion. We have stock. We have a company that's trying to be international and growing that has value, but needs to raise money. So it sells stock. And then we have an ability to exchange the, that item, that security. And that's the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, where individuals can buy in and trade those assets um, because they want to either have that ownership because they believe in the company or they believe that somebody believes in that company. And at the end of the day, um, they will make money from the ownership of that stock. I knew we'd get a great answer on that one. I'll just I'll just say for the listeners, Chase Chase reads books about banking and finance for fun in his free time. That is so he's yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's very knowledgeable about the history of these things. But thank you. Personally, that was an amazing ride across history. If you if you want to learn about this subject, you can go deep into it. And it's and it's crazy because you think about I think when I was growing up and I learned what a stock was, uh, it, when I first heard about it, I was like, well, why would that ever exist? What is the point of having it? Like, I know what a loan is. Mm-hmm. I need to do something. I can't pay you all of it now, but I will have the profits to pay for it later. What happens when you need way more capital than that? Well, stocks, you know, people think of stocks as gambling or, or maybe that's just a fictitious market where people are betting back and forth. There is a purpose for them. And this is that it is, is to allow these companies to develop and grow in a way that provides for an ownership stake for individuals. It's kind of like a crowdfunding source for companies where the funders have an entrepreneurship relationship with those companies. Yeah, and that and that relationship is clearly defined. So, mm-hmm. you know, Um, You can have a a stock in which you have controlling shares and you have an ability to vote on decisions that are made in that company. Now, 
it's important to know what you have and what you don't have when you have stock, right? When I say you have ownership of the company, let's say you buy stock in Chase Corp. If you have 15 shares of Chase Corp, you don't own, or 15% of the shares of Chase Corp. It doesn't mean you own 15% of the things in Chase Corp. If I walk into Chase Corp and I want 15% of the computers, I'm not gonna get them. That's not what you own there. What you own is the value and the assets of that. You own, you own 15% of 100% of the ownership of that company. Excellent description, Chase. I think that's very interesting. Last episode, we also talked about the stock market, mm -hmm. but we want to cover that more too here. You talked a little bit about it already. Can you describe the stock market now and maybe in relation to like the history that you've already alluded to? Yeah. So originally you have markets set up and, you know, here in Chicago where I'm, I'm living, you know, we're fam famous for other markets too. Um, think of a market exactly that term where you could buy and sell something like a farmer's market or um, here in Chicago, the commodities market, which you can buy lots of farming related things. A stock market is the exact same thing. What it is, is it's, you, are, you have folks that are interested in selling their ownership stakes, these stocks in companies, and you have people that are interested in buying them. And that's where that, that happens. Now, they, they happen through exchanges, um, and those exchanges are, are like privately set up. And probably the ones that, that you are most familiar with here or most of our listeners are familiar with are with the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Those are also the largest stock exchanges in the world. And those are set up to buy and sell certain, certain companies. Um, the interesting thing is, of, of all of the stock exchanges in the world, and there are honestly hundreds and thousands of them, the New York Stock Exchange has roughly 31, 32% of all the assets uh, in the world, NASDAQ about 14 and a half. In total, the amount of assets being traded on the stock exchange is in the $90 trillion uh, level. So it's a lot of money that's going through. And and we'll probably get to this, I know a little later, a lot of people hear that number trillion with a T and think, well, that's that's our economic growth, that people are trading on the behaviors of, of the economy. And that's not exactly what we're doing. Um, and we can go into that later, but that's basically what an exchange is and what a, the stock market is. Thank you. And thank you for clarifying stock market versus stock exchange. And whenever I try to educate people, there's a lot of confusion with those. The market yeah, is where you're buying and selling. The exchange is how that happens. So um, New York Stock Exchange is not the stock market. It's part of the stock market. Yeah, that's definitely an important distinction. And I want to make another one too, because I think in general, when people hear or just talk about the stock market with maybe their friends and family, they might often be referencing or thinking about market indexes. Um, so Chase, could you describe what those are and what's different between those and the market? Yeah, so a market index, like um, you might hear the S&P 500 or something like that, is a listing of specific companies that have some sort of shared item with them in order to capture something that the market is doing. So the S&P 500 is a collection of the 500 largest companies that can be traded on the major American stock exchanges. And so when you have, when you're buying into those indexes, you're buying actually like a, a basket, a suite, a tranche of all of those companies, those 500 companies. And as that does well, you do well. Uh, and maybe, and the reason why you'd buy into these indexes is you have a thought about where the largest companies in the United States are going, or uh, maybe you have a thought you can you can have different exchanges over uh, different industries and, and things like that, or areas of the world, and and that will help you. You have a thought on that that'll help you have an investment spread across a number of different companies. What I will say though, is the reason why a lot of these indexes exist is to cut down on some volatility. If I own one share of a stock in a specific company, 
my entire value of that stock is dictated by whatever happens to that company and whatever the market dictates is the value of that company. An index allows for having a larger spread on number of companies, which pulls down the velocity of that investment. So there's not as many high and low variations. That's the theory. <laughs> Theoretically um, in an index compared to an individual stock. You, you, you have more of it since an individual stock for an individual company is susceptible to whatever happens to that individual company. There's usually more volatility with that than having a basket of a lot of companies. It's like anything with volatility. You're taking essentially the average benefit of all of those entities. And therefore, if that the general trend is upward, you'll do better overall. If the general trend is downward, you'll do worse overall. A lot of things have to go right or go wrong for you to have um, dramatic changes in those index funds. But it does protect you from wild swings if you have some of those you know, singular stocks. According to Investopedia, which right now feels like a close personal friend since we've been talking about <laughs> investing so much yeah. lately, there's around 5,000 indexes in the U.S. alone. That's obviously a lot. Are there any indexes that measure the entire market, not just the U.S.? Any state-specific ones, maybe? If you're trying to get um, the largest capture of, remember with indexes, they are, they are a select amount of the companies that are traded at any given time in the world. There are indexes like the Wilshire 5000s that try to take a huge basket of companies. Um, and there are some that are on the world side to do that. Just know that there are some there are some companies that do get left out of that discussion that may be traded somewhere in the in the world. The the interesting thing about stocks in general is is over time we've had less and less companies um, and, and this is a more recent time uh, trend actually listed on stock exchanges. Um, there's not as many companies as we once had. The Wilshire 5000, if you think about it, it, it in its name, just as the S&P 500 is 500 companies, Wilshire 5000 should be 5,000 companies. It's not, because there aren't 5,000 companies that are traded, uh, that are listed really. I mean, it's just about that amount, right around 6,000 in total. Um, and it's going down. And, and that are actually listed. So there's, I think, actually like 3,400 companies or something like that listed on the Wilshire 5,000, even though you'd think it'd be 5,000. So yeah, there are large indexes um, that that are that people are familiar with. And then if you go to an investment professional that they might have uh, in that suite um, that you might be uh, looking at. So Sorry. that's a lot of companies though, even though we're not reaching 5,000 with that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that one index. 6,000 is still a lot of companies. In the U.S., yeah, yeah. In the U.S. How does that compare to the total amount of businesses in the United States? I'm glad you asked, because this is where we get to why the stock market is not the economy. So you have, you have let's say, the 6,000, and that's a fluctuating number of listed companies. And this tend to be your large companies. There are over 30 million companies in the United States. So, you know, you have a lot of companies that aren't even close to, um, to this, this situation. Now, what I will say about that number is the vast majority of those companies are sole proprietorships. I am an, a single lawyer. I am a single graphic designer. I am a single nanny. And you're essentially your own boss. Theoretically, that is an incorporated company that is that is measured and tracked by the Small Business uh, Authority here in, in the United States and also in the Department of Commerce. But there are a ton of businesses that are very small um, between you know, two employees and 500 employees that aren't anywhere close to being listed on the stock exchange. The restaurant down the street that is Ma's Cafeteria Ma's Cafeteria is not listed on the stock exchange. McDonald's might be, but Ma's Cafeteria is not. That is an individual company that's not listed there. You have uh, individual retail outlets, uh, dog grooming places, barbers. 
you know, those are all individual companies that are just not listed. There are even large companies that don't feel like they should be publicly listed because A, they either don't need to raise capital, they have enough money. Remember, the original purpose of this is to grow your company and they don't need it because they have the cash on hand. Um, and they maybe want to restrict who has ownership in. Because if you list yourself publicly on a stock exchange, you have to disclose what you're doing. You have to make a lot of open disclosures to people that might own your stock, as well as people considering investing in it, that maybe you don't want to do. That's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, Maybe a company is like, I want to show how good I am and all of the different things. Um, and here's, here's I'm publicly offering that, that money. Uh, that that information, or I might be like, look, I, I, I this is my company. I don't, I don't want anybody else looking into it other than those that regulate me and tax me, um, and that's fair. So just remember, even though there's a lot of companies and they're all the companies that you know, you're everything from Sony to uh, you know Bank of America, uh, you know all, all these McDonald's to Disney. Are, are, are on this exchange, it isn't the vast majority of companies that exist in the United States and the, well, the world. And even nonprofits, a lot of nonprofits aren't going to be on the stock exchange either. Yeah, that's, that's a very important distinction to make for our listeners that like the stock market does not equal the economy one-to-one -one because it just even though it's it's very large and it's huge, it's, it doesn't encapsulate everything. And, and I want to just to be on that point real quick. When the stock market falls and when it rises, it does impact the economy. These are your tend to be your larger uh, uh, companies. So if they are doing bad as a collective or good as a collective, that obviously impacts the economic output of the country or the world. But it doesn't mean that there aren't smaller companies struggling to try to you know, do different commerce. During this pandemic period, it's a lot of the small companies that really suffered, that had very tight overhead, those sort of things. You don't see that necessarily on the stock market. Where you see that is consumption and those items, and that eventually will work its way through the economy but while they have an impact, it isn't a read for the entire economy. It's one of many metrics, right? And usually it's a lagging indicator. It's yeah. not, it's not the, it, it doesn't necessarily flash a red light of here are things to come. It's more things have happened and look what is occurring. Yeah, that's, that's really good perspective to keep on, on all of that. But I, I do want to put some some like numbers behind the stock market. So according to Sibilis Research, uh, which is a global financial data firm, the total market capitalization of the U.S. stock market, meaning the value of the entire stock market in December of 2020 was 50.8 trillion. Yeah. And according to the SEC, the annual trading value, meaning the amount of money traded back and forth in a given year, uh, of U.S. securities in 2019 was 97 billion dollars. Oh, I'm sorry, 97 trillion with a T. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trillion. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a big difference. Um, but so that's obviously a, a enormous sum of money. Chase, could you tell us like what that means and what all of that money is doing? I think you touched upon it briefly earlier, but like, what is that money doing? So it is real money. People, people have often argued that what is happening when you're trading back and forth on, on stock is not necessarily a, a uh, is not necessarily real money. You're, you're trading back different paper, but think about what is, is happening here. I have a position in a company and I am selling it to somebody who would like to buy a position in that company. There is a real money transaction that is occurring there. I am making money from selling it you are spending money from buying it. That is economic growth and in some ways it's output at the very least. And so that money is capturing the general value of different entities at any given time when you're measuring those, those entities. So that money is going to something. Does it have an impact on your life directly and on a day-to-day -day basis? Depends on who you are. 
And in some ways, it when you have uh, market fl fluctuations between those different transactions, it's not something that necessarily is impacting your general community. You don't, you might not have a McDonald's in your neighborhood and decisions aren't being made on the corporate level for McDonald's due to the stock valuation that impact your neighborhood. Um, that being said, in the long haul, because of this allows for the growth and shrinking of other companies, that's the generally what you're capturing there. Different companies are growing, different companies are not. And, and that will work its way out through all of commerce um, at some point in time. It may have an impact on you directly, but oftentimes it's indirectly and over time. Thank you, Chase. I think that's a great um, perspective as well. In the previous investing episode, we talked a little bit about the bull and the bear markets, but I'd like to ask you, so when people talk about the stock market going up or going down in value or money, quote, disappearing when the market is doing poorly, what does this mean? So the bull and the bear, these are just general trends that exist uh, that are kind of slang for, for a market. A bull market is generally when you have a rising economy. Um, bear market is the opposite uh, when it is receding. So, you know, when you're riding a bull economy, things are on the rise. It's great. Bear economy, you know, it's, it's uh, more of a disaster. People will often say generally, you know, what that means for individual stocks or individual asset classes or something like that. So you might have a bull market in tech companies or something like that. But in general, when somebody says, hey, there's a bull market, that means that generally the stock market is on the rise. And when they say there's a bear market, it's on the decline. So that's usually um, how, you, how you judge that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should probably also ask a little bit about something that's been in the news a lot, since I know that you are very aware of what's going on, as well as the history of some of the stock market and financial information out there in the world. So in January 2021, GameStop started getting a lot of attention in the media and even was the subject of a congressional hearing in the House Committee on Financial Services on January 28th. So we explained to our listeners what short selling is on our last episode, but Chase, could you break down what happened with GameStop's stock since it's more recent and how short selling played a role in that? Yeah, and I, since this is a general financial type literacy podcast, I want to explain a very key component of short selling to, to highlight a risk that happened here. And I'm talking about this generally. I'm not talking about this in terms of GameStop. I'm just saying short selling. So when I buy a stock, and this is pretty um, obvious, the value that I have wrapped up in that stock is the amount that I purchased it for. So if I buy Chase stock at $1, and it rises to $50, but then it goes all the way down to $0. The amount of money that I have lost in that investment that I realized is $1. I lost $1. Now, I could have sold it some point in time and made $50, well, really $49, and that would have been great. But really, the amount that I put in risk, that I put on the table as a potentially risky item was a dollar. That was my underlying investment. And until you realize the gain or loss, you haven't booked that entire valued win. There is some limitation, therefore, into the amount of money that I can lose by bet buying a stock. It is the amount that I purchased it for. That is not true with short selling. Short selling is the idea of I, when I buy a stock, I'm buying it on the belief that the stock will rise in the future. When I short sell a stock, I'm thinking the opposite. I believe that the stock will fall in the future. How you do that is where you get into the risky aspect of short selling. So I will, usually when somebody short sells a stock, they borrow that stock with the understanding that when they, to sell, to, you, you borrow to open. So you borrow that stock to utilize it and you sell back that borrowing after a period of that contract to realize a gain or a loss. 
when you believe the price will be lower. Therefore, you make the difference between what the price was when you took the position, let's say it's $50, and what you had to buy back on the market, let's say the price fell to 25, then I buy that, that new stock price for 25, make the borrow whole, and I've made that $25 spread in between. If, if the stock price rises, if my bet is wrong, then I owe that amount. I have to make that whole. So let's say instead things went wrong and I uh, the price of the stock went to $75. Well, okay, so now I have to buy the 50, which I've already borrowed. I borrowed 50, so that value is even. Um, and then I owe an additional $25. So that's my loss, 25. And they're usually done on these margin accounts so that um, you, you might be buying 10, thousand dollars worth of stock but you actually have like fifteen thousand in there or five thousand in there to make sure that if something happens on the wrong side um, you can cover that that rise in price if you were wrong here's the thing though if you noticed in the beginning with stocks you can only lose as much as you put in for short selling you can lose an infinite amount of money technically because the amount of the value of the stock in a future date is unlimited. It could keep going up. It probably never happened, but like you could theoretically lose an untold amount of money in between that. And so I just wanna caution people that are just interested in that subject that yes, people make a lot of money, especially hedge funds off of short selling. But it is a far riskier type of, of asset than it is, or practice really, not asset, than when you're just simply buying stock. You can make a lot of money in short selling. You can lose a lot of money too. So it's important to know those, those differences. GameStop, which I'm not going to take an opinion on GameStop either way. I'm just saying what happened to cause the situation that was in the news earlier was GameStop was a retail outlet, is a retail outlet for mostly video games and items like related to video games, things like that. And over time, retail outlets have um, gone down in value in the United States. On a general list, people might be familiar with Sears and their bankruptcy or Toys R Us and those sort of things. And the reason for that is as we've developed as, as a society, um, we've been buying more things online. We've been buying less things in brick and mortar institutions. And when you have a brick and mortar retail outlet, there's a lot of cost in upkeep of those brick and mortar places. So if you don't move to adapt to maybe sell some of those pieces or and move more to online, you know, you're at risk of, of struggling. Some of the most popular brands when I was a kid, you ask the kids now, they'll have no idea what I'm talking about. Blockbuster was a huge deal when I was when I was a kid. It is completely extincted from the face <laughs> of the earth. No one there's knows one. what I'm talking about. There's yes, one there's, there's there's one. Yes, <laughs> I, I mean it, it. It is it is it is something that happens with a lot of these retail outlets. So as such, a lot of folks were down on GameStop for that very reason, like they are with a m number of items, um, and so a lot of individuals, but really hedge fund companies or hedge fund managers, um, not companies, uh, they felt uh, negatively about GameStop. They would think because of this general trend that I have told you about that GameStop was too heavily valued right now and would decline in value over time. So they shorted that stock. So much so that GameStop really became the most shorted stock in a lot of different uh, avenues in life which is never fun. Um, usually when you are the most shorted stock, there's some polarized opinion on you. So there's a lot of stock in the, in, in the market that maybe people are buying. And a lot of people think you suck too. Like there's a lot of things that people might be wrong. That polarized opinion. One of the most famous examples of this would be uh, GoPro. There were a lot of people that thought GoPro was a really great company because the thing they did, people loved. But there was a lot of people that shorted GoPro. And the reason why was because they did one thing. And the general economic principle of doing one thing is this. You make money as long as it's something that no one else can really make or have value in. It's usually called the toaster concept. You can, you can make something if you're the only one that can produce a toaster. 
but everybody has a toaster. So if all you do is make a toaster, you're not going to make a lot of money because you can get a toaster anywhere. Once GoPro becomes a toaster, as in like there's a, a many different versions of them, that values that company down because it's the only thing that they do. And that was the polarizing opinion on them. GameStop had a different polarizing opinion. You have folks that really believe that you that that company essentially should be bankrupt or close to bankruptcy. And therefore they're short selling. Even though GameStop does a lot of things, the thing they do is kind of going away in our society. So that, that was the general bet. So flash to January. You have a lot of entities, uh, you have a lot of people that are involved in some of this that have a difference of opinion on GameStop. And let me explain how that happens in a normal short selling environment. You might have a run on a type of a stock uh, when you see there's a lot of short selling and people think that you made the wrong investment and other hedge fund companies come in, or not companies, I don't know why I keep saying that. Another hedge fund comes in and says, you're wrong about your short selling position. I'm going to buy that entity. And that squeezes that other hedge, those other hedges out of it. And that as that rises, obviously it weakens the short seller's position and they have to get out of it. This happens. It happens fairly regularly. It, um, it's happened in, in many different ways before. Usually this is a, an issue between multiple hedge fund managers or funds and large fund managers or institutional investment. That's not what happened with GameStop, which is probably why it is something that is of particular interest. It happened in a more, happened in a more democratized version of investments. I'm not going to take an opinion on whether that's good or bad, um, but what essentially happened, as we know now, and there will be more information as this goes forward, is that some individuals on a Reddit thread, uh, which I had to get explained to me exactly how what this Reddit thread worked, believed that that this uh, hedge position on GameStop was incorrect, and so they started buying the other side, and that had a, a large following and a large community that all started buying into that. So suddenly GameStop has a lot of folks interested in their stock. And it might not be one large institutional investor as it normally is large institutional investors going against each other. In this case, it's a lot of people going up against a hedged bet. That squeezed the hedge position and that caused this sort of um, interesting situation where GameStop, which not a whole lot had changed in that company, um, suddenly had a lot of value and it pushed out these hedge fund positions. We can talk about whether or not why this became so dramatic for those hedge funds in that normally when you're buying a stock, you can only buy as much stock as is available to be bought. You know, that's how you limit that purchase. But in terms of short selling, that's a little bit of a, a, a malleable market. Because it's not like I'm buying something now, I'm borrowing an existing stock to make a bet later. So really, there was a higher amount of short sellers, there was a higher percentage of short sales than there was actually stock available in the market, which causes this problem later on for when these hedge funds and the institutional investors try to unwind their position. And then we get to um, you know, this discussion in front of Congress and, and things like that of why this happened, whether it was a good thing, uh, whether we need to add more regulation, and that's going to be an ongoing conversation. That, that was an incredible breakdown of, <laughs> of what happened there. And I'll just be clear, there is a lot more that happened there. And don't make, and I don't want it to be thought of as the little guys on Reddit beating the big guys on Wall Street. There is certainly some of that. There's also some big guys on Wall Street that took, saw the position of the Redditors and also took that position. It's not as clear as a picture as maybe it was reported at first blush, but it is an interesting scenario and it does tell us a lot about the market as a whole and whether or not this is something that we need to think about in terms of uh, if this is a good or bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, there is obviously a lot going on with it with this particular situation. And you kind of, I think you kind of touched on this in your explanation, but, you know, it's not very common to see stocks shoot up like in value, like GameStop did, you know, I think over the course of, 
a few months, it went from a valuation of about $20 to in the thousands of dollars valuations. You mentioned the squeeze. Could, is that like what makes GameStop so irregular is that it was squeezed to that extent? I think the irregularity of GameStop is, and there are, and there are stocks that have performed in history that have made multiple hundreds of percent on their initial value. This happened a lot more in the early days of, of American stock exchanges and other stock exchanges elsewhere, where you could take advantage on so-called penny stocks that weren't a lot of value, but you could maybe dump in a lot of value to, to boost them up and then sell them off. But the interesting thing about GameStop and why I think people are fascinated about it is, is, is that aspect of a lot of people pushing on one side against the hedge position of large hedge funds. Normally, when things like this happen, when there's big moves and money, it's one large group of very wealthy individuals against another large group of very wealthy individuals. And that did happen here in certain spaces. But as technology has developed and there's been more ways to get into the market and do day trading and things like that, it has made things like this more possible, where you have this perception that a lot of little guys, let's say, were able to beat the big guy on, on a thing. And that, that's kind of a, a rare scene in, in how the stock market usually ro rolls. That being said, like I said, that's not exactly what happened here, but that was the general perception. And I think that's why um, people were fascinated by this story. I think that makes a lot of sense, the accessibility of the market along with the interconnectedness of the social media being used could empower individual consumers to do similar things that have happened in the past. So can you, Chase, can you define institutional investors and, mm -hmm. and what you mean by that? Yeah, there's different market makers in, in any market. And these are maybe there, there are different classes of these. So you have people that are, there are funds and individuals that are moving prices in, in items because of their buying and selling power. Um, you can see those as being hedge funds, but really the larger market makers are like large pension funds, large fu uh, sovereign wealth funds, things like that, that can, that can spend billions of dollars on particular items to, to move money. Then you have the brokers and the banks themselves that are making the purchase on behalf of that individual. And they have to trade off at the way to protect themselves from that bet and facilitate those trades, require them to buy and sell things all the time to make them available. And those also those actions also just dictate changes on the on the market. So these are these, this is usually when you have a market maker or a, or something that is capable of having a huge impact on a market, it's really just the size of money. So if you have somebody who is capable of making a large purchase or large expenditures, that will dictate uh, you know, kind of what you're seen as in, in the market. Whereas me, Jace, I don't have enough money to individually make a change in, the, in that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's important to touch on too, is just the amount of money on when when people mention in institutional investors, they just mean like a, a large amount of money versus your average person who probably doesn't have that much capital that they can can put behind the behind the stock. But I know so this just happened obviously a short while ago. This was in January. We're just got into March now, and there was the congressional hearing on on the twenty eighth. Do you think it, I don't know, Chase? It, have there been any like next steps to come out of this situation or like, are there going to be more hearings about this as we go forward? I think that that's an important thing to think about in this whole situation is what did we learn here and what are we going to continue to learn? Um, you know, I think a lot of people saw this as a David versus Goliath situation and uh, David got one over on, on Goliath and, and in certain ways that that's true. And in certain ways it's not, but it is starting this larger conversation, which I think is important about, you know, some of the companies that have led to the democratization of, of sales that make it easier for people to day trade and, and have individual investment accounts. Um, you know, 
what is the future going to look like for that type of industry, as well as, you know, what hedge funds do, what short selling is, and whether or not those entities, which are traditionally less regulated than other places in the market, whether they need to be regulated more or everything is fine. There's a good argument to be had that what happened with GameStop was okay and exactly how the market is supposed to behave. And then there's another argument to that is in some ways of equal value that, well, maybe we don't need this and we don't want to have this volatility in our markets. That conversation is going to unfold, not in just the next couple of months or through one congressional hearing, it's going to happen over years. And as we have more people participating in this market directly, as opposed to indirectly with your retirements and your pensions and and all that stuff, you're going to have more scrutiny into this industry and an area that maybe doesn't, hasn't had the most scrutiny um, throughout its its entire history. It sounds like with all the attention that's happening, that there's a possibility that regulation could be introduced that may help consumers, individual consumers that are actively trading through these different apps that are make it more accessible, but it also could stifle some of the historical growth from the market. Obviously, none of us here are financial advisors. No, and that's important for everybody to know. <laughs> Yes, none of us are financial advisors. I am an educator and Chase and Jake are regulators. So I think we all have a a vested interest in consumer advocacy. And I think that's part of the reason why we're, we're interested in providing investment education. If you do want to, to reach out to someone, you should reach out to a financial professional to buy and sell these types of products if that's something that you're interested in. Yep, and I would would argue you should do your research there. Um, There are a lot of different types of investors and financial advisors that have different responsibilities. So it's it's important to make sure that you know what, you know, what, what what you have gotten yourself into. I actually did a webinar with University of Illinois Extension on how to choose a financial professional a couple of years ago, again, on our YouTube channel is recorded for IL student money. If you want to check it out, that explains the differences between those types of financial professionals and questions to ask and licensing to look up, like on IDFPR's website, when you're legitimizing those types of people. So yeah, we Andrew, you just mentioned, you know, consumer advocacy. And we've talked, Chase has talked, you know, about how situations like this can can pose risks to individual uh, investors as well as the institutional ones. So, and, and Chase, you've mentioned day trading um, on, these, on these newer apps. How is that different from say someone who only has money in the stock market via their retirement fund or a college savings plan? Uh, almost no one has uh, a retirement fund that's purely based on stocks or, or, or student loan services. Usually, usually when you're saving for college or you're saving for retirement through like, let's say a pension or some sort of college savings 529 account, it's, it's a basket of a couple of different investment items. And some of them will be stocks and some of it will be bonds. A day trader is somebody who is investing in specific spot stocks, taking specific positions, and is monitoring very different changes every day in, in the changes in the, in the market. They're taking positions based on research that they have done or have been given um, because they believe in in something that is happening. That's not what's happening when you're investing in your retirement or your or or college uh, uh, because through the traditional um, instruments because those are usually more meant for you to invest in them, not check every day, but you know every few months or even every year, uh, so that you kind of generally understand the trend. They are long investments. Day trading might be a shorter position um, because they think a specific thing is going to happen. Um, and that's really the difference. Thank you. Yeah, that I think that's like important to, to we covered it a little bit in our last episode and in investing in like the different amount of risk that people are comfortable with. But I think that is important to distinct, you know, investing is not, you know, one size fits all. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. All of this is a lot to consider. And obviously we don't want to scare any of our users off of 
potential investing. As we discussed in our previous episode, investing does involve a certain degree of risk, which we discussed at length, and you should gauge that risk before you consider investing. But there are obviously benefits to investing, like the time value of money and compound interest. But Chase, before we let you go, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to give our listeners on stocks and investing? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people uh, saw the GameStop thing or see other changes in the stock market and really want to know how people got made money off of that or how people lost money. And it can be kind of an interesting thing because it, it looks like a maybe a game like you would see in a casino or something. Just it's good to know where stock come from, from its point and the people that are making these bets on either side or make taking these positions, which is a better way of putting it, what research they have done, why they are making those decisions and how that impacts you. I think the stock market itself is a fascinating subject to learn for anybody, whether or not you're going to get into stock trading or, or, or anything else. It's just interesting to know what it means and what it doesn't mean. It's, and, and why it does impact the economy, but isn't the economy. I encourage everybody, not necessarily to trade stock, but I encourage everybody to learn what stock is and how it impacts your life. Yeah, that's, I think it is. I, I can tell from, I know I can tell the listeners from personal experience, since I started working for Chase, uh, I've become much more interested in the stock market. And it's, there's, there's a lot of interesting and incredible things to learn about it. But Chase, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today and, and shedding some light on what exactly happens in these cases such as GameStop uh, and, and sharing all your knowledge about the stock market with our listeners. To our listeners, if you want to be more active in the stock market, there are certainly options available to you. But as always, we encourage you to do your research, engage the level of risk, risk that you uh, are comfortable with before investing. Yeah, I, thanks, guys. I completely agree with Jake. Thank you again, Chase, for... Uh, sharing your expertise on the show again. The next podcast, we're going to be covering a topic that we've covered on, before on the show, but we want to take a more in-depth look at it. We're going to talk about credit. One of my personal favorite things to talk about. We'll be joined by some of my colleagues from the University of Illinois Extension and DePaul University. We'll go over topics that we covered in our Conscious Credit webinar, which is again on our YouTube. I'm really pushing the YouTube <laughs> this episode, so you won't want to miss it. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.